Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel and thank you for joining me for another true crime deep dive. Okay, today's case is crazy. I have to be honest, I first heard about the bizarre case of Cindy James when it was requested in the comment section of a recent video. I wish I could remember who requested it. I gotta start like screenshotting that so I remember because otherwise, I'm not gonna remember. So I started looking into it and initially I was without a doubt intrigued, but all the articles I was reading kind of were seeing the same thing and they all left me with more questions than answers, leading me to believe that a video on Cindy's case would be a short and simple one, like a coffee and crime time. But then as I do, I started looking for more in-depth information and I went to newspapers.com as I do, love newspapers.com, found a ton of stuff that I hadn't read in any of the articles. A ton of stuff. <laughs> a ton of stuff. And before I knew it, eight pages of notes had turned into 28 pages of notes, and I had a far better understanding of what I believe happened here. Although I will admit, even knowing all I do, I'm still not sold. And I think that I stand in good company because I, I think even with all the facts, you still don't know exactly what happened here. The body of 44-year-old nurse Cindy James was found in the yard of an abandoned house in Richmond, British Columbia, which is in Canada, in June of 1989. Cindy had been drugged with 10 times the lethal amount of morphine. Her wrists and ankles had been tied behind her back with black nylon stockings, and a black nylon stocking was found wrapped around her neck. This discovery would be shocking enough without the fact that for the prior seven years, Cindy James had reported to the police no less than 90 separate incidences of harassment and violent attacks at the hands of some unknown and twisted assailant. It was the end of a tortured life for Cindy James. Since her separation from a Vancouver doctor in 1982, James had become well known to Vancouver and Richmond police. More than 90 times she complained of harassing phone calls, break and enters, men following her, and in 1983 she was hospitalized after being found beaten in her garage. Between 1982 and 1989, police had spent roughly $1.5 million investigating her claims and protecting Cindy from her unseen attacker. And in the aftermath of her death, officers with the RCMP, which is the law enforcement in Canada, they considered this investigation to be the most bizarre and exhaustive case they had ever encountered. After several months of tracking down leads, following evidence, law enforcement ruled that Cindy's death had been either self-inflicted or accidental, causing her parents, Otto and Matilda Hack, to speak out in anger that their daughter had been terrorized for years and the police had failed to protect her from a person or persons who would become her eventual killer or killers. This vehement difference of opinion led to a coroner's inquest, which was scheduled initially to last just three weeks but stretched to 40 days, making it the longest and most expensive inquest in British Columbia history. I will say I did not expect all of the twists and turns that I encountered during my research into Cindy's life and death. And I ended up feeling very sad about everything, very sad. But we are going to go through all that I know piece by piece. And at the end, I guess we're going to try to determine exactly what happened to her. We can have conversations about that in the comment section. But before we dive in, let's have a word from the sponsor of today's video, my favorite, Native. With Native's Best Sellers Pack, you can enjoy every part of your shower routine with their best selling products, their body wash, their deodorant, and their Dio and Body Spray. Included in the Best Sellers Pack would be the deodorant and body spray, the deodorant and the body wash. All the things that I love from Native, and honestly, I love everything from Native, but the body wash, the deodorant, and their deodorant and body spray, I use every single day. Native's products are clean, simple, and effective, and will keep you smelling good all all day long. Native's classic deodorants are aluminum and paraben free with ingredients that you know like coconut oil and shea butter and they also provide up to 72 hours of odor protection with a non-sticky texture that feels dry while applying. 
Their deodorant and body spray applies light as air with a cooling mist that dries on contact, leaving you smelling great and feeling fresh, providing instant odor protection and not leaving any yellow stains on your clothing. Plus, it doubles as an all-over fragrance spray. It's amazing. The sprays are made with just six ingredients, including nitrogen, which is an ozone-friendly natural propellant. They're aluminum, paraben, and hydrocarbon propellant-free, vegan and cruelty-free, and they use denatured alcohol in the sprays that is made from corn so that they dry quickly and fight odor. And Native's body washes are made with naturally derived ingredients to help cleanse your skin. They're phthalate and dye-free, vegan and cruelty-free, and they use citric acid for pH balance to keep your skin feeling ultra happy. And nothing, truly nothing beats the luxurious lather of a Native body wash. The body washes froth up so beautifully without any sulfated surfactants, which makes them a super amazing addition to your bubble bath. And the body wash are also residue free so you leave your shower or bath feeling silky and smooth hydrated smelling absolutely delicious native has a huge range of scents to please anyone from the subtle sweetness of vanilla with the beachiness of coconut or the salty breeze of sea salt and cedar or if you'd like something a bit sweeter you can enjoy the fruity sweetness of sweet peach and nectar which i also suggest getting in the deodorant and body spray because in my opinion that is the best scent whatever combination you can think of they probably have it with limited edition scents launching all the time like natives limited edition fall escape collection featuring vanilla and cactus flower desert grass and sandalwood honey and cigarro you can trade the conventional familiar sense of fall like pumpkin and apple for the alluring sense of the southwest autumn here are some of my all-time favorite scents grapefruit and bergamot which i have in the body wash and the deodorant coastal oak and amber which is kind of woodsy my husband's always stealing it from me and of course the oak OG Stephanie Harlow favorite scent, which is cherry vanilla macaron. I have so many of these huge bottles of body wash, and I'm so happy about it because I honestly get stressed if I'm about to run out. And of course, I have that in the matching deodorant as well. You can get your best sellers pack today. Normally, it would be $36, but if you use the link in the description box and use my code StephanieH35, you can get your deodorant, body wash, and deodorant and body spray for only $24. That's awesome, and it's 33% off. Once again, use the link in the description box and enter code StephanieH35 at checkout for 33% off your best sellers pack. Thank you so much to Native for sponsoring today's video, and let's dive in. Cindy James was born Cynthia Elizabeth Hack on June 12, 1944. Her father, Otto Hack, was an English teacher who had retired from the Royal Canadian Air Force after 30 years of service, and her mother, Matilda Hack, was a stay-at-home mom to Cindy and her five siblings that included three older brothers and two younger sisters, with Cindy being right smack dab in the middle. After high school, Cindy went to nursing school where she met Roy Makepeace, a married South African psychologist who worked at Vancouver General Hospital and who was also 18 years her senior. The two met while he was a resident physician and she was a student nurse. And five months after Cindy graduated from nursing school in 1966, she and Roy were married, I assume in that time period he divorced his first wife, and for a while the couple lived a normal and uneventful life. From 1966 to 1975, Cindy worked as a pediatric nurse at Vancouver General Hospital before being offered a team coordinator position at Blenheim House, a facility dedicated to caring for children with behavioral and emotional issues. And a couple of articles I read said that Blenheim House was for preschool children with behavioral and emotional issues, which is crazy because preschool children to me is like three, four, five, you know? How many behavioral and emotional issues can children that young have? That is so sad to me. But Cindy would actually go on to work at Blainham House for the next 12 years. And during that time, she earned the respect of her colleagues, including many psychiatrists. They said she was competent. She had amazing work ethic. And they really respected her dedication to her young patients. In July of 1982, Cindy and her husband, Roy, separated. Now, Roy Makepeace would later say that they had shared a picture-perfect marriage, but they'd eventually 
eventually grown apart when Cindy began spending a lot of time working in her garden and she stopped spending time with Roy and she no longer shared his love of sailing. Roy said that they had initially decided on a one-year trial separation and this separation began very amicably. Once she was single and separated, Cindy moved into a home at 334 East 40th Street in Vancouver and this was very significant for her because it would mark the first time that Cindy had ever lived on her own. But soon, she would come to regret that decision. On October 7, 1982, two months after her trial separation from Roy, Cindy received her first of many threatening phone calls. Later, Cindy's mother, Matilda Hack, would say, quote, She said it was just a voice. Sometimes it would change, the sound. And sometimes it was just whispering. Sometimes it was nothing, just silence. End quote. So from what I could gather, there were a lot of these phone calls where it was just silence. The papers would refer to them as no-talk phone calls. Sometimes the caller would simply just whisper Cindy's name, and sometimes they would say uh, very explicit, terrifying things. One night, a very scared Cindy had gotten one of these calls and then she'd hurriedly closed the drapes in her living room, only for the mysterious caller to ring her back, telling her there was no use in hiding. On October 11th, 1982, Cindy received a call where she could only hear loud breathing noises. And when she hung up, the phone rang again. This time when she picked up the phone and breathlessly put it to her ear, she claimed she heard a voice whisper ominously, I'll get you one night, Cindy. Terrified that she was being stalked, Cindy eventually went to the police, who told her to start keeping a log of dates and times that she would receive these calls with details of what the caller was saying or doing on the phone call. So when I say doing, obviously they're not doing anything that you can see, but are they just sitting there? Are they not seeing anything? Um, are they breathing heavily? Do you hear anything in the background that might suggest where this call is coming from? In the log that she started keeping, Cindy made notes, and we can see that the incidences escalated from phone calls to acts of vandalism and terror. On October 15th, Cindy reported that she heard and saw someone lurking outside of her house, and the next morning she found her porch light had been smashed in. She also claimed someone had thrown a rock through her window and entered her home, but she reported that nothing had been taken or disturbed as far as she could tell. On October 19th, Cindy told the police that someone had entered her home and slashed a pillow on her bed. Cindy would continue to keep track of these incidences and report them to the Vancouver police, but the harassment did not stop. It only got worse. Over the next three months, Cindy reported hearing someone prowling outside of her house in the dead of night. Her telephone and cable wires were cut multiple times, and she started finding threatening and bizarre notes made from letters cut out of magazines. Vancouver Police Constable Pat McBride of the Royal Mounted Canadian Police, or RCMP, as I will refer to them in the future in this video and the one to follow, he was the first officer to conduct a major investigation into the odd events happening to Cindy James. Because of the constant calls, letters, and home invasions, Cindy and Pat McBride were constantly in contact, and they became close, with Cindy turning to Pat for help, personal protection, understanding, friendship, and eventually romance. Now, the two would continue their relationship for almost a year, and Pat McBride even moved in with Cindy for a short period between October 31st and December 1st of 1982. He did this, you know, obviously because at that point he had a closer intimate relationship with her. He had a personal reason to protect her. He wanted to keep an eye on the area. He wanted to see if he could witness any of these events happening. He wanted to see if he could catch the culprit behind her harassment. Now, McBride, he actually did a lot for Cindy. He arranged for extra police protection. He installed new locks in her home. He even arranged for a security system to be installed. But two days after moving in, Pat reported he found Cindy's ex-husband, Roy Makepeace, sitting in a car in an alley behind Cindy's house. When Pat McBride confronted Roy, he found that Roy Makepeace had two guns in his possession. But Makepeace told McBride that he was patrolling the area due to being concerned for Cindy's safety. 
In mid-November of 1982, Pat McBride was at Cindy's house and he received a phone call from her alleged stalker. And when he answered, he heard no one speaking on the other end. But he would later testify that he thought the call might have come from the airport because he thought he heard a woman's voice on a PA system in the background. And as you know, in the airport, sometimes you will have, you know, somebody talking over a PA, announcing flights, things like that. Not so much anymore, I think, because we have our phones and apps and everything. And I was actually just thinking about it as I was telling you. And I was like, I don't remember the last time I've heard a PA announcement at at the airport. So, But back in the 80s, definitely that is how they would announce, you know, flight 350 from San Francisco to New York is leaving from Terminal 5, Gate 3 in five minutes, something like that. And then you'd rush to get to your plane. Constable Pat McBride would also report that he personally had found the phone lines outside of Cindy's home cut in five different places. Now, obviously, Cindy's estranged husband, Roy Makepeace, would be suspect number one when considering who could be responsible for her harassment, especially with Constable McBride finding Makepeace outside of Cindy's home in a very compromising position with guns kind of lurking. He was her ex-husband. There was a separation. It seemed the separation was Cindy's idea. Maybe Roy Makepeace wasn't super happy about it. When something like this happens to a woman, it is many times the spouse or romantic partner who is responsible for it. So for many reasons, Roy was considered a suspect very early on. But Cindy herself would give conflicting statements to friends and family on how she felt about Roy. Initially, Cindy said that Roy had been one of the first people she'd called when the harassing calls began, and he confirmed this. And she said he'd been the one to tell her to immediately go to the police, and he seemed very concerned. And although she had told a few people close to her that Roy had been abusive to her during their 16-year-long marriage, she also said she didn't believe he was capable of hurting her. Roy Makepeace would later deny any serious physical abuse, claiming he had slapped Cindy a few times, but it had never escalated beyond beyond that. Maybe in the 80s they didn't consider men slapping women to be physical abuse, but I mean, either way, it is. Roy also claimed that when Cindy called him, telling him that someone had broken into her house and slashed her pillow with a knife, he rushed right over. But he was surprised when she begged him to get rid of the pillow instead of, you know, show it to the police or bring it to the police. He would later say, quote, she absolutely insisted I throw it away. She was so frightened of it, almost as if it had symbolic meaning, end quote. In late November of 1982, Cindy James found a note taped to the windshield of her car. And it was kind of a scary note, okay, because the note contained a picture of a corpse, reportedly. At the end of December, she found another note, this time outside of her house, and it read, Merry Christmas, which is a nice sentiment, but it also included a picture of a woman with her throat slashed, and the paper and the picture were splattered with red ink to resemble blood. So not such a great sentiment, maybe. At that time, Cindy's tormentor had been keeping his or her distance, taunting Cindy with letters and phone calls, But on January 27, 1983, that would change, and Cindy's torture would become much more up close and personal. Now, Cindy was close friends with a married couple, Agnes and Tom Woodcock. The Woodcocks were in their 60s, older than Cindy, and they viewed her almost as a daughter. Agnes Woodcock had met Cindy through the Blenheim House, where Agnes worked as a bus driver. And she would later testify that in late 1981, Cindy had started coming into work with some injuries. One time she had her ankle in a cast, another time she had a black eye, and according to Agnes, Cindy claimed that her then-husband Roy Makepeace was responsible. Agnes said that Cindy had hurt her ankle when Makepeace pushed her down the stairs, and Cindy'd gotten a black eye from being hit in the face with a heavy glass ashtray wielded by Roy Makepeace. Other co-workers of Cindy's would report similar instances of seeing Cindy with some bruises, some injuries, and having Cindy tell them that Roy was responsible. And specifically, one co-worker said that she remembered Roy coming into Cindy's workplace the day that Cindy showed up with one of these injuries, and she saw Cindy and Roy in Cindy's office, and Roy was, like, comforting her and saying, oh, I'm so sorry that I did this to you. I'm so sorry, and, like, rubbing her hair and hugging her. Now, this would have been in 1981, before Roy and Cindy were separated. But on the evening of January 27, 1983, Agnes Woodcock stopped by Cindy's house around 9.30 in the evening, but when she knocked, 
There was no answer at the door. Agnes assumed that Cindy was taking her evening bath as she did every night, so she waited for a few minutes at the door, but then she heard something from the side of the house, and she thought maybe it was Cindy outside in her garden or taking the garbage out or something. So Agnes went to investigate, and she found Cindy in a very bad position in her garage. Agnes said, quote, I found her crouched down with a nylon tied tightly around her neck. She had cuts to her arms and legs. Cindy said she'd gone to the garage to get a box and someone grabbed her from behind. All she saw were white sneakers, end quote. Cindy had a pair of black nylon stockings wrapped several times around her neck. And this article of clothing would become the trademark of many of her future attacks, including the attack which allegedly led to her death. However, when law enforcement arrived to investigate, they questioned what had actually happened to Cindy that night. Initially, Cindy had told the police the same story that she told Agnes. She'd went outside with a box. She'd been attacked from behind in the garage. She hadn't seen her assailant. But Constable Valen Woolicott could find little evidence of a struggle at the scene of the crime, which would have been the garage. He said that nothing was knocked down. All the boxes in the garage were neatly stacked up. There just didn't seem to be any mess or anything that you would see if somebody grabbed a victim from behind and the victim struggled to, you know, get free from their assailant. Woolicott also found a chair placed directly under a wooden crossbeam. And this kind of led him to wonder if Cindy had potentially tried to take her own life because inside, on the counter of the bathroom, Woolicott also found blood stains. And when he asked her what the blood was from or how it had gotten there, he described Cindy as being uncooperative. Very uncooperative, actually. Cindy was later brought in for a polygraph exam administered by Vancouver Police Detective David Bauer-Smith. And after failing the polygraph, Bowers Smith implored for Cindy to tell him everything she knew. And it was then that she came clean and modified her original story. Cindy said that she'd been inside when a man came to her back door. And at first she thought that the man was Constable Pat McBride. But when she opened the door, the man cut her on the hand with a knife. And then he took her to her garage where he and another man threatened her, wrapped the nylon tightly around her throat, and promised to cut her on her eyes and her chest if she didn't keep quiet. Cindy also said that she had seen the man who appeared at her door before. She said he had shown up at her home in September of 1982 holding a wad of cash and asking where Jimbo was. And according to Cindy at that time, this man also asked her if she wanted to have sex with him. Now, when asked why she hadn't told the police this at the time of her attack, Cindy claimed that the men had threatened to hurt her sisters and her mother if she ever sent the police after them. Now, around this same time, the end of January 1983, Cindy James received another disturbing note from her stalker that read, I see you, and it included some graphic pictures cut out from magazines. There was a picture of a hand holding a knife, a woman clutching her throat, and a body bag. On February 1st, 1983, Cindy moved to a new house in West Vancouver, hoping to escape the constant threats and more potential attacks. But less than a week later, she received another letter, which read, Run, rabbit, run. I'll show you how fucking good I am. Soon. Bang, bang. You're dead. So in April of 1983, after getting this note, after the threatening and creepy calls continued at her new address, Cindy moved again. During the summer of 1983, it appeared that Cindy's husband, Roy Makepeace, was attempting to make peace with her, pun intended. Roy said he wanted to reunite. He wanted to give their marriage another shot. They had decided on a one-year trial separation. It had been a little bit over a year, and he was ready to see if they could, you know, make things work. So he would show up to her house with flowers and lavish gifts. He even paid for Cindy to fly to Indonesia to visit her older brother, Roger, who was stationed there with the military. On August 22nd, just a few weeks after returning from Indonesia, Cindy received a note from her stalker which read, Welcome back. Death, blood, hate, etc. (laughs) I'm sorry. It's not funny, but (laughs) that kind of letter, death, blood, hate, etc., it almost feels like the person who's like posting these letters together or pasting these letters together is like, I have nothing original left to say. You know, the run rabbit run thing was like very clever, but now I just, I don't know. Like I have no more threatening things to say. So death, blood, hate, etc. <laughs> it's just whatever. You get the point, right? You get the point, Cindy. I'm angry and violent. Death, blood, hate, etc. So ridiculous. The following October, something truly 
horrifying happened when Cindy, a notable lover of animals, found three dead cats hanging from trees in her garden. They were hanging by their necks, and attached to one cat was a note that read, You're next. Now, it was around this time that Cindy hired private investigator Ozzy Caban, hoping that he could help her identify the nefarious force that had suddenly entered her life, forcing her to live in fear every single day. And from day one until the very end, Ozzy Caban always believed that Cindy was truly being harassed and attacked. And over the six years that they worked together, Cindy and Ozzy became very close friends, and he was extremely protective of her. Caban's security firm had actually been the ones to install a security system into her first home under the direction of Constable Pat McBride, and Ozzy had also given Cindy a panic button to keep on her person at all times when she was in her house. That way, if something happened, she could press it, and it would notify Ozzy directly of her distress. Ozzy also provided Cindy with a two-way radio, so that way, even if her phone lines were cut again, Cindy could communicate with him, and he could bring help. On the evening of January 30th, 1984, Ozzy heard some strange sounds coming over this two-way radio, and he rushed right over to Cindy's house, finding her front door locked. He peered through a window, and he was shocked to see Cindy laying on the ground inside her house, unmoving and with black nylon stockings wrapped tightly around her neck. So Ozzy quickly went back to the front door, and he kicked it down, rushing to Cindy's lifeless body and finding the most bizarre scene. Ozzy Caban would later say, quote, there was a note that was pinned with a paring knife through her hand. I went to the telephone and called 911, and within two minutes, she revived briefly, and then they took her to the hospital. She told me that she noticed a man coming through the gate. The next thing she remembers is being hit on the side of the head with a piece of wood or something of that nature. She then remembered being held down on the floor, and she remembered a needle going into her arm, end quote. According to Ozzy Caban, the note stabbed into Cindy's hand read, now you must die, cunt. I always feel weird saying that word. When the police arrived, they were a bit suspicious of Cindy's claims for several reasons. Mainly because the door of her house had been locked from the inside and deadbolted. Ozzy Ben had had to kick it down. There were no signs of forced entry anywhere else, and there was a needle mark found on her arm, but no substances were found in her system. Additionally, Constable Kyo Ikoma, who was on the scene at Cindy's house that night, he reported seeing blood in circular patterns on the floor as if someone had tried to clean it up with a mop. And he claimed that in 10 years of his time as a police officer, he'd never come across a scene where the assailant attacked, fled the scene, but before leaving the scene, used a mop to clean up blood around his victim. Cindy was given another polygraph exam, and it was initially reported that she had passed it. But years later, after her death, the RCMP would retract that statement, instead claiming that the results of the polygraph had been inconclusive. Several months passed with no other physical attacks, but the calls and the notes continued. Then, on June 18th, Cindy called P.I. Ozzy Caban in a panic. Caban once again rushed to Cindy's house and found her hiding in her garden, claiming someone had broken into her house. So Ozzy entered the house, he looked around, eventually ending up in the basement where he found Cindy's dog Heidi cowering in the corner with a string wrapped around her neck. Heidi had been abused and was found next to another note made with letters cut from magazines. The note read, Last day's warning. Run. Death. Happy birthday, love. Now, this was six days after Cindy's birthday that this happened, this note and the dog Heidi being attacked. In the weeks that followed, the body of another dead cat was found, this time on a staircase inside of Cindy's home. And on July 1st, Cindy claimed that two men dressed as police officers knocked on her front door, but they turned and ran when she used her two-way radio to contact Ozzy. Just over a week later, on July 9th, Cindy's mother, Matilda Hack, spent the night at her daughter's house. And in the middle of the night, she claims she was woken up by the dog, Heidi, barking loudly. Matilda left the guest bedroom and said she found Cindy rushing around on the main floor of the house, checking to make sure that all the doors and windows were locked and secured. But both women jumped a mile when they heard the doorbell suddenly ring. And when they finally felt brave enough to peek out and open the door and see what was going on, they found that a window near the front porch had been cracked in several areas. After the January 1984 attack, Cindy and Ozzy Caban established a reporting system in the event of another incident. 
The plan was that before leaving her house on any given day for any reason, Cindy would call Caban's security firm, and then she would call again to let them know that she had returned safely home. On July 23, 1984, Cindy used this system at 8.16 p.m. to let Ozzy and his team know that she was going out and she'd be back in about an hour. When Cindy had not called to let them know that she was home by 9.30 p.m., Ozzy Caban went to her house. He saw that she wasn't there, and he called the police. Cindy was eventually found 18 blocks away from where she lived, and she was in bad shape, so she was taken to the University of British Columbia Health and Sciences Center for treatment. She reported that she'd been walking her dog, Heidi, in Dunbar Park around 8.30 that evening when she was attacked by a bearded man in a green van and his female passenger. Ozzy Caban would later say, quote, The next thing she remembered was a strong grasp around her neck, at which time she was apparently dragged into the van. She remembers at least three people holding her down. She could feel the needle going into her, end quote. Several hours later, Dazed and confused, Cindy showed up on the doorstep of a random home, and the man who lived there opened the door to find her with black nylon stockings wrapped around her neck, so tightly that he had to cut them off, at which point she immediately collapsed. At the hospital, Cindy was found with needle marks in her arm, and reportedly, while she was a patient at the hospital, hospital employee Lisa Littimore reported that a man with a thick accent had called and asked about the hospital security policies. Like, did they have security guards? What time did the emergency ward close? Detective David Bauer-Smith played a tape recording of Roy Makepeace's voice. Roy Makepeace was Cindy's ex-husband. And Littlemore claimed that she felt the accent of the man who'd called the hospital and the accent of Roy Makepeace were very similar. She said uh, the accent was almost the same and the timbre of their voices was also very similar. In October of 1984, Cindy James underwent hypnotherapy to see if she could remember anything about the culprits involved in her multiple attacks. During a session, Cindy briefly mentioned witnessing a double murder, but she was unable or unwilling to give further information. The following January, during a three-hour hypnosis session and in the presence of Vancouver Police Sergeant Chris Bajornad, Cindy began to talk about this alleged double murder again, but this time she was more specific. Cindy claimed that on July 23rd, 1981, she and her husband Roy were on a boating trip. At some point, Roy tied the boat up at a wharf somewhere in the Gulf Islands, which are located in the Salish Sea between Vancouver Island and the mainland coast of British Columbia. Cindy stated that she didn't know exactly where they tied up the boat because she'd been asleep below deck for a while, but she did say that she remained on the boat for a little while while her husband went off to allegedly look at some property. Now, at some point while she waited, Cindy claimed she heard someone shouting, and she shouted back, but no one answered. So a few minutes after this, Cindy put on some pants and shoes, and she went ashore to investigate, finding herself eventually in front of a log cabin. She knocked, but no one answered, so she let herself in, and it was then that she was horrified to see the bodies of two people, a man in his 30s and a woman in her 20s, on the cabin floor. And Cindy saw her husband, Roy Makepeace, standing above them, holding a bloody knife in his hand. Cindy said she screamed at Makepeace. She said he was a murderer and she ran out of the cabin, but he pursued her, grabbing her, slapping her on the face, and shaking her. Cindy said she kind of blacked out at that point, and the next thing she remembered was sitting on a bed in the cabin and watching as Roy chopped up the two bodies of his victims with an axe, carefully placing each piece in a plastic bag that they would later throw overboard when they were back on the boat. Once the deed was done, Cindy claimed Roy rubbed the blood from one of the victim's severed legs on Cindy's face. Obviously, these were very serious allegations, and the police investigated them as such, but they could find no missing persons or reported murders in that area during that time period. Sergeant Chris Bajornrud personally took a six-hour cruise of the Gulf Islands aboard an RCMP vessel on April 19, 1985, hoping to be able to identify the location where Cindy claimed these horrible murders had taken place. But he never could. He never could find this log cabin with tons of blood soaked into the floor, as you would expect. Additionally, Cindy's sister Melanie would later testify that when Cindy told her about the murders in February of 1984, the details were completely different. Cindy had told Melanie that there had only been one victim and that a hatchet had been used instead of an axe to dismember this victim. And when Makepeace rubbed the victim's blood on Cindy's face, he'd also held a knife to her throat and said, I could easily do this to you. 
Now, it is important to note that around this time in early 1985, Cindy, who had previously been described as being superb at her job, she was asked to resign from Blenheim House after her decision-making skills became questionable. And we can understand this, right? If everything that's happening to Cindy is true, this would be extremely stressful. This would distract you from your work, your personal life, everything. It would be all-encompassing. It would take all of your mental strength and energy to not break down every day while you're living in terror, wondering, when's the next attack going to happen? When's the next letter going to arrive? When my phone rings, who's on the other end? when's the other shoe going to drop? Now, Cindy would later give police permission to record a phone call between herself and her ex-husband, Roy Makepeace, where she would confront him with her memories about what he had done to these two unknown people in this log cabin. But first, Ozzy Caban took Cindy to Lions Gate Hospital for a week of rest, as he called it, on June 21st, 1985. At that time, Cindy was committed to the psychiatric ward under the BC Mental Health Act by two physicians who had examined her. So that means that Cindy was committed non-voluntarily. And it seemed that Cindy had been struggling with her mental health that spring. There was a reported potential overdose where the psychiatrist felt she had tried to take her own life. Cindy would later say she had not meant to take that much. She was not trying to take her own life. She'd been having terrible nightmares. She was suffering from insomnia. She'd stopped eating. She was losing weight. And it appeared that she was very depressed. And like I said, she may have even been suicidal. But once again, if you look at what she was living with, the the circumstances she was living under, all of this can make sense. You might not have much of an appetite if you're being harassed and stalked and you just never know what's going to happen next. You would be depressed. You would have a hard time sleeping. You would have nightmares. All of that kind of adds up. Now, reportedly five days later, Cindy was released after her father, Otto Hack, and her older brother, Douglas Hack, convinced the doctors that Cindy was just having a hard time. She wasn't, you know, having a mental illness. She wasn't having a mental breakdown. She was going through a lot of stress at home, and her issues were stemming from all of that stress and trauma she was experiencing every day at the hands of some unknown night stalker. So on July 2nd, 1985, Cindy James called her ex-husband Roy Makepeace while the RCMP recorded the conversation. Cindy told Makepeace that she had remembered what he had done while she was under hypnosis, and she wanted to talk to him about it before calling the police. And initially, Roy Makepeace seemed taken aback by the call, but progressively throughout the call, he gets more and more agitated, angry, and defensive. He informed Cindy that he'd been told by his lawyer to not discuss her situation with anyone since, like I said, from pretty much day one, Roy Makepeace had been considered the main suspect. And Cindy wasn't really doing a lot to kind of dissuade people from feeling that way. The police had been questioning him nonstop. They'd been bothering him every time something happened to Cindy. They called Roy. And according to Roy Makepeace, Cindy's chaotic life had started to cause negative effects to his life. And he told her, quote, I'm certainly prepared to listen to anything because I'm very, very, very curious about what the hell has been going on, you know, because it has affected me badly and it damn near cost me my job. It cost me a fair amount of money with lawyers, fees, etc. And quite apart from that, let's say I feel somewhat abused, end quote. Cindy told Roy basically like she knew it was him who was harassing her and she didn't understand what he had been doing to her for the last few years, to which he responded, quote, what I've been doing to you for the last few years, end quote. Makepeace told Cindy that he'd had no contact with her for the past 18 months. And when she asked if he denied being the one who'd been harassing her, he became quite angry, telling her, quote, my God, I think you ought to have anything you have to say in front of my lawyer. I am certainly denying it. I have always denied it. I have absolutely nothing whatever to do with it, end quote. Are you denying it? My God, I am certainly denying it. I always have denied it. I have absolutely nothing whatever to do with it. Makepeace also said that if Cindy was going to dump this on him, he would have to eventually consider suing her for damages to his reputation, telling her, quote, I warn you, you have to take the consequences because it is all entirely unfounded. I think you are not only treading a very dangerous path, but you are also sicking the police on me, which means you are distracting them from where the real source of your problem is, end quote. 
Roy Makepeace told Cindy that he felt she was doing this to him for one of three reasons. She was insane, she had something to hide, or she wanted to take some enormous revenge fantasy out on him. To which Cindy replied, quote, Roy, that isn't going to work anymore. I'm not insane. We both know that you have been doing it. End quote. Makepeace warned her after she said that. He said, say that again. Say that again in public, and I'm going to see you in court. To which Cindy said, quote, Roy, I'm not going to listen to this garbage anymore, end quote. And then she hung up and she terminated the conversation. So this recorded phone call between Cindy and Roy was meant to elicit some sort of confession or admission of guilt from Roy Makepeace, but the police felt that if Makepeace was the culprit, the phone call might actually trigger him to act out in some way and maybe call Cindy, put a note on her property, or even attack her again. So after the call, the home of Cindy James, Roy Makepeace, and two other unnamed suspects was immediately put under 24-hour surveillance. But the operation ended after just five days, with the RCMP claiming they could no longer justify the cost, since during that five days, nothing was happening. Literally nothing. But later that month, after the police surveillance ended, Cindy was targeted again. She found a package at her home containing a pair of black nylon stockings and a note that read, blood flowing freely. On July 27th, Cindy opened a box she'd found on her front porch, and she discovered several cosmetic jars inside. But the contents of the jars were not makeup. Instead, she claimed they held the raw flesh of some small animal. And then on August 5th, 1985, Cindy would call the police and report the first of three fires that she claimed someone had set in her home. On August 21st, Cindy called the police reporting another fire, which had been set while she and her dog Heidi were out for a walk around 3.15 in the morning. It was at this time that the RCMP began to wonder again if Cindy maybe wasn't the one setting fires in her own house, if she wasn't the one doing these things to herself, because some of her stories were not adding up and evidence at the scene sort of excluded the possibility of an intruder. And we will get into the specifics of that evidence and how it excluded the possibility of an intruder in the next video. Now, one police officer in general, Carol Halliday, she believed that Cindy had been lying and staging her own harassment and attacks since the very beginning. And Holiday also felt that some of the male police officers who'd been on the case previously had been, quote, conned by the histronics of a pretty woman. End quote. So Holiday asked Dr. Anthony Marcus, a psychiatrist with the University of British Columbia, if he could give his input on Cindy James and her case. And Dr. Marcus later testified at the inquest, saying he'd been contacted by the RCMP in the fall of 1985, and he'd read summary reports of the police file, as well as sitting down and interviewing Cindy in person twice. Once again, Dr. Marcus had plenty to say about Cindy James and what he believed had been going on with her, but we will talk about that in the next video, part two in the conclusion. On December 1st, 1985, Cindy moved again, this time to a house on Clay Smith Road in Richmond near the University of British Columbia campus. Now, one of the features that Cindy really liked about this new place was that there was no back alley near the house, and she felt this might prevent lurkers from being able to hide and watch her from afar. Cindy also painted her car, she changed her phone number, and in early 1986, she would legally change her last name from Makepeace to James. But all of these precautions still did not protect her from once again being tracked and found by her elusive stalker. Just 10 days after moving in, on December 11th at around 6.20 p.m., Cindy was found by a passing motorist in a water-filled ditch four miles from her home. She was semi-conscious, she was wearing men's work boots that didn't belong to her, and she was wearing only one glove. And once again, there was black nylon stockings wrapped three times around her neck. She had thin cuts and bruises on her forehead and what was described as fingernail-like abrasions and scratches on her chest, legs, hands, and back. Cindy was also suffering from hypothermia, so she was brought to the hospital where doctors assessed the drowsy and unresponsive Cindy for a possible head injury or overdose. Needle marks were found on her arms, and benzodiazepam, a mild tranquilizer, was found in her system. Cindy told the doctors and the police that she had no memory of how she'd ended up in that ditch. She only had a slight memory of being tied up in a strange room. Her car was later found parked on 29th and Alma near Blenheim House, where she'd once worked, and inside the car, they found her keys and her purse undisturbed. Now, after this, Cindy's good friends, Agnes and Tom Woodcock, began spending the night at Cindy's house to keep watch 
operation to keep her safe, and they were there on the evening of April 16, 1986, when around 2 a.m., Tom Woodcock claimed he was woken up by the sound of a loud thump coming from somewhere in the house. As he was getting up to get dressed and investigate, he said Cindy ran into the room and asked, Tom, did you hear that noise? Did you hear that thump? And so then Tom and Cindy walked out into the hallway, and they immediately smelled smoke. When Tom got downstairs, he found a fire had been set in the ground floor den of the split-level house. And he would later testify that when he opened the door to air out the house, he saw a man standing outside in the street. When Tom tried to confront the man, the man ran away. Agnes Woodcock also claimed that Cindy had yelled to her to call 911. But when Agnes had picked up the phone, there was no dial tone. And the next day, firefighters showed Cindy and the Woodcocks where the telephone lines had been cut outside of the house. Now, the Woodcocks would both later testify to multiple instances of things happening that they believed Cindy could not have been responsible for. They said they'd been at Cindy's house on April 2nd. They were all sitting at the table together, and the burglar alarm went off. The alarm had been triggered when someone lifted out an aluminum window on the basement door, but Cindy had never left the room. She'd been in their sight the whole time. Another night, they were all playing cards at Cindy's house when someone unscrewed the back porch light. Agnes said that she'd heard someone unscrewing it, and then she'd heard someone run down the back stairs after this happened. For several days after this fire incident, the Woodcocks reported that Cindy fell into a deep depression. She seemed despondent and hopeless, and she refused to eat. On May 3rd, Cindy was admitted to the psychiatric unit at St. Paul's Hospital, and three days later, she was once again involuntarily committed to Riverview Psychiatric Hospital, where she underwent a psychiatric evaluation, resulting in her doctors feeling she was suffering from depression and anorexia. Cindy reportedly remained at Riverview for 10 weeks, and when she was released, she began regularly seeing a psychiatrist, and reports coming in from the psychiatrist claimed that her mental health seemed to be improving. For over a year things seemed to calm down. Cindy didn't report any incidences of harassment, arson, or violence to the police. But this peaceful time would not last. In October of 1988, police were dispatched to the home of Cindy James after she had activated her Sofrex handheld emergency alarm. They arrived to find her in her car, unconscious, naked from the waist down, her bare legs dangling from the open driver's door. Cindy had been tied up with black nylon stockings, and another pair of stockings was found around her neck. Additionally, duct tape had been placed over her mouth to prevent her from breathing, and she'd passed out. When she went to the hospital, they actually said she was in a coma. Now, when she finally woke up, Cindy unequivocally pointed the finger at her ex-husband, Roy Makepeace, claiming he'd been responsible for her attack. And, of course, Makepeace denied any involvement in any of her attacks, and he was able to prove that he was not even in the country for at least one of them. On April 8, 1988, Cindy, who had been working as a nurse at Richmond General Hospital, found a note left on her car when she left work that day. The note simply said, soon, Cindy, and someone had also written the words, sleep well, backwards, in the dew on Cindy's car windshield so that the message could be read by whoever was inside the car. On May 25th, 1989, those who talked to or interacted with Cindy James reported that she seemed to be happier than they'd seen her in years. She went out to run some errands, such as picking up her paycheck and buying a gift for the birthday of the eight-year-old son of a friend. She got a makeover, she picked up some groceries, stopped at the bank, and then she was supposed to go home where she was meeting Tom and Agnes Woodcock at her place to play bridge. But when the Woodcocks arrived to Cindy's house shortly after 10 p.m., her car was not in the driveway, and no one answered the door when they knocked. Cindy's 1981 blue Chevy Citation would later be found in the parking lot of the Blundell Center shopping plaza, locked and without her in it, but there was blood found on the driver's side door, and Cindy's ATM card and bank deposit slip had ended up sliding somehow underneath her vehicle. Cindy's body would not be found until June 8th in the yard of an abandoned house at the corner of Blundell Road. She was found to have died from a lethal dose of morphine and other substances, but there were no vials or syringes found anywhere nearby. Her hands and her feet had been tied behind her back. She had black nylon stockings wrapped tightly around her neck. Police would investigate Cindy's death before finally ruling it a suicide, and this was a decision that her friends and family 
were really not happy about. They heavily disagreed with it. And her father, Otto Hack, angrily said, quote, the police did not investigate the possibility of homicide, of somebody murdering her, but zeroed in on trying to prove that she committed suicide, end quote. Other supporters of Cindy also spoke out, claiming there was no way she could have administered the deadly doses of drugs to herself and then still have been able to be with it enough to tie herself up in the way that she had been tied up. And the police, the RCMP, claimed they had investigated. They'd poured hundreds of man hours and hundreds of thousands of dollars into the investigation. And they had looked at every possible scenario, including that Cindy had concocted this elaborate plot in order to take her own life. Now, this difference of opinion would lead to the longest and most expensive inquest in British Columbia history. And during these several weeks of testimony, things would be revealed that would turn the case on its head. And I mean, we had, I think, something like 80-something witnesses testify at this inquest, witnesses in favor of Cindy, like the Woodcocks, like Ozzy Caban, like um, Constable Pat McBride, people who had known Cindy on a professional basis, like her co-workers who would say things like, she got calls at work too. We heard these calls. Sometimes we would get calls for Cindy when she wasn't even there. There were these no-talk calls or people saying creepy things like, oh, get rid of her, get rid of Cindy, things like that. There were people who had witnessed some of these incidences of harassment, some of these incidences of violence, and they felt that Cindy could not have been responsible for them. And then there was people who had talked to Cindy in a mental health capacity, therapists, psychiatrists, doctors. There were police officers, some who believed Cindy, some who absolutely didn't, some who didn't know where they stood. And like I said, this inquest was supposed to be, you know, pretty cotton and dry, and it would end up extending on for 40 days just because there was so much information. And then we're going to find out things about Cindy that maybe we didn't know before, specifically things about Cindy's childhood her past, her family dynamics that might answer some questions about why she was the way she was and why she would maybe end up doing some of the things that she ended up doing. So it gets very interesting. And this was a lot of the stuff that I had found on newspapers.com because it talked about the inquest. Whereas when I was looking at everything on just, you know, Google, all the articles were, were talking about all the stuff that happened to Cindy but really nothing was talked about that went down in the inquest. So it was left as this big mystery without any explanation. And I'm going to say, once again, I still don't think that it's very cotton dry. I'm still left on the fence about it, as was the jury at the inquest who, you know, inevitably found that they couldn't decide one way or the other whether Cindy had done this to herself or whether she'd been the victim of some violent attack. So that shows you just how really not cut and dry it is, how there are so many gray areas in this case. But we are going to talk about all of that next time. But before we go, I do want to talk about something else that's very important. So last week when I posted a video, I also posted a post. I also posted a post on my community page. And basically, um, I was just talking to you guys, my community, about how grateful I am for all of you, how I know that my life is what it is today, and I have this level of fulfillment that I get from creating this content strictly because of all of you. Without you all, I would not be as happy as I am. I would not be as fulfilled creatively as I am. And I owe you all so, so much. And I feel like there's obviously no way I could ever repay every single one of you back. But I also said that I often, in the comments of my videos, see that people are watching the videos while they're um, answering emails for their small business or packing up stuff and shipping it out for their small business. And that led me to wonder, like, how many of you have small businesses and how many of you, just like me, wanted to create something of your very own, not have to work for anybody else, and, you know, just carve your own path in the world. And I know that that is very difficult and that we could all use a little help. So I said that every time I record a video, I want to showcase one of your small businesses. And I asked you guys to email me at stephanieharlow at stephanieharlow.com to tell me what your small business was about. In the subject line, I asked you to put the subject as small business so that I could organize them. You all were very great about that. And I got so many emails, guys. I mean, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of emails. And it, at first, it was a little overwhelming. But then I started looking through the emails. And I was like, these are really cool. These are super cool small businesses. Like, you guys are really out there doing it. I'm just so proud of you. I think it's so awesome. And I think that a lot of 
the people in our community could benefit from not only the products and the services that you all have to offer, but benefit from supporting each other because that feels good. And it feels good to, you know, you need to buy something or you need some sort of service and you know you can support somebody who's a part of something that you are also a part of and believes in some of the same things that you believe in. So today we are talking about a small business from Canada because it's a Canadian case and I thought, why not? Now she did say that she is in Canada and she ships to Canada, but she also does often ship to the United States. So yay. Her name is Jessica. She's a homeschooling mom of three, and she started running her Etsy shop in order to make enough money for her children and in order to stay in a different province with her parents as much as possible to avoid the toxic home life that she finds herself in. Now, it's awesome because Jessica makes a bunch of cool things that all sort of have to do with like books and reading. And as you know, I don't know if you do know, actually. I don't know why I always say, as you know. This could be your first time watching this video. This could be your first time ever hearing my voice. I love reading. I love books. So she makes book sleeves, pouches to put your book in to keep them from getting damaged in a purse, et cetera. So this is actually great. Like if you bring a book to a beach or to the pool or like as I will tell you, I keep like little perfumes, lip glosses and stuff in my purse and they for some reason always leak out and get all over everything. In fact, my lip gloss now tastes and smells like my perfume. Don't know how that happened. But it's great to have your book in something so that it doesn't get damaged or stained. She also makes gorgeous watercolored bookmarks and wood sliced ornaments that her dad and brother cut for her in Northern Ontario and she paints those with acrylic paints. Jessica's Etsy shop is called Cozy Book Sleeve and these are so cute. The bookmarks are adorable. I love the watercolor look of them. The wood slice ornaments, there's one with like books and then a little coffee cup with a heart on it and I love that one. And the book sleeves are very cool. So there's one with skulls, there's one with bumblebees and as I was looking through this I was like did did Jessica arrange her Etsy shop to put all the things that I like at the top when I'm going through it because I like, you know, kind of like skulls and stuff like that. You guys know. Look at Dale Cooper back there. I love bees. So does my daughter. There's a dragonfly one. There's ones with like little frogs hanging from a line. Not like hanging badly, like holding onto the line. There's one with like um, kind of like a Halloween theme with like it looks like martini glasses and wine glasses with like potions in them. Like these are very, very cute and everything is so super reasonably priced. So I would ask that if you guys are looking for anything like this, if you love books or you know a book lover who needs something like a book sleeve, who needs something like these beautiful watercolored bookmarks or these really cute, well done book slice ornaments, go check out Cozy book sleeve. Support Jessica, support those in our community. I've linked her Etsy shop in the description box to make it easy for you so you can check it out and say hi to Jessica. Say hi to Jessica in the comments and tell her what you think. Even if you don't need anything or even if you're strapped for money right now, tell her that she makes cool stuff and just give her some, you know, like encouragement because running a small business is hard, especially with three kids and homeschooling. And I have a lot of respect for that, Jessica, a lot because I remember when Bella was born, I started doing wood burning and selling on Etsy to make some extra money. And it was very, very, very difficult, very difficult because there's just a million other things you have to do when you're the mother of small children, when you're the mother of three small children and you're responsible for their education. So a lot of respect for you, Jessica. Thank you so much for emailing me. And if any of you out there who didn't see the community post also want to take part in this, email me at Stephanie Harlow at stephanieharlow.com and put in the subject line, small business. Tell me about your small business, link it so I can check it out. And I will, you know, I, I will hopefully one day, maybe in 10 years, get to every single one of your small businesses. We're going to do it. We're going to do it. Thank you guys so much for being here. Don't forget to check out Native in the description box as well. Don't forget to like if you liked this video, uh, share if you think it's worth sharing, subscribe if you haven't already. Let me know what you think so far about this case in the comment section. I love hearing from you guys. And until next time, stay kind, stay beautiful, and stay safe. And I'll see you very, very soon. Bye. I got
got blood, blood on the strings. 